What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another audiobook. Now, let me just adjust my microphone real quick. Okay. Um, this one is Clethrophobia, the third story in Somniphobia. Uh, Clethrophobia obviously means the fear of trapped places, um, whereas cla claustrophobia is the fear of being... Wait, no, I got it the complete wrong way around. Claustrophobia is the fear of small spaces, and Clethrophobia is the fear of getting trapped, and that's of course what this story is about. Um, so I guess you can kind of predict what's going to happen in this, but uh, actually you have no idea, because it, this is a great story. Um, I do just want to say real quick, um, this story, like, the prologue is the best thing I've ever read <laughs> in these books. So prepare yourself. If you want a, like, genuine reaction to this prologue, I did do a reaction to the leaks, so you can go and watch that if you want to. But we're going to get straight into this because I'm super excited to read it fully. Anyway, yes, let's do this. Clethrophobia, boys. Kim looked up at the stained glass dome in the centre of the roof over Freddy Fazbear's mega pizzaplex. She grinned and spun in a circle, taking in all the music and laughter, the glowing neon lights, and the constant motion of the crowd and the attractions. A line of cars on Fast Freddy, the pizzaplex's roller coaster, roared past. Fast Freddy, we've heard that before in Under Construction and in, uh, in Pressure and in Haps. Uh, it's the same pizzaplex as those. And the glass dome, of course, is the same. Uh, Kim gazed eagerly at the coaster's screaming passengers, their hands waving above their heads. She couldn't wait to be one of them. She wanted to go on the roller coaster first. Kim frowned and looked around. Why were her friends headed away from the coaster's line? She hurried to catch up with them and found them arguing over the pizzaplex map. Let me see it, Alicia demanded her curls bouncing as she tried to snatch the map from Cole. Cole easily held the map out of her reach. We agreed that I was the one in charge of the map. Eric sneaked up behind Cole and grabbed it. If you two are going to keep fighting over this thing, I'll hold on to it. Kim rolled her eyes. You know they give those things away, right? We all could have had one. I told you, Alicia said, hands on her hips. That's a waste of paper. It's not good for the environment. Eric snorted. He threw out his arms to indicate their surroundings. And this is? Alicia glanced around. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Kim took the map from Eric. He didn't protest and instead looked at her in his usual adoring way. Kim had met her friends in kindergarten, and Kim had known that Eric had a crush on her since the first day of the, on the playground, and all of the seven years since. He'd never admitted it, but it was obvious. Kim's mom said Eric thought he wasn't good enough for Kim because Kim was a pretty blonde with Eric and Eric wasn't particularly good looking. Kim didn't care about that, but she thought of Eric as a brother, not a potential boyfriend. Kim opened the map and motioned for her friends to follow her. Cole looked like he was going to argue, but then he shrugged and hurried up on her right, falling in step behind, beside her. Sorry. Kim looked down at the shiny surface of the map. She realised it was upside down, and she turned it over. Cole poked at the map. It's like a big donut, see? Kim gave Cole a look. Or maybe like a big pizza. Cole flushed. Yeah, that too. It's a similar to thing, uh, it's a similar thing to what we heard in, uh, in frickin' Haps. <laughs> um, wait, what was I doing? Where was I? No, oh, Cole flushed. Yeah, that too. Eric pre pressed against Kim's left side. He tapped the map, pointing at a cutesy illustration of happy-faced bumper cars. Then he nodded over his shoulder at the real bumper cars, which were careening around a small arena. We're here, Eric said unnecessarily. You think? Cole said. Kim studied the map. It wasn't an ordinary map with just place names and directions. It was more like a series of cartoon drawings, each depicting a venue in the pizzaplex, and each linked to a drawing of one of the Freddy's animatronic characters. The drawings were prominent, the captions under the drawings were in small print. Chica, for example, hovered over a drawing of a giant swing that was to the left of the bumper cars. To the left of the swing, a bright yellow arrow pointed at a row of smiley-faced stick figures lining up for roller coaster cars. I'm sorry to keep pausing, but uh, it's kind of crazy. 
kind of insane that we're getting a fully fledged map of the pizza plex i have made a video on this you can go and watch it right now i've made a map on of the pizza plex and i have also made uh, a timeline uh, just in case you wanted to know that uh kim stopped she pointed it behind them we need to go back that way a couple of older kids bumped into eric and alicia watch where you're going one of the kids snapped you can't just stop in the middle of the walkway Alicia took Kim's arm and got her moving again. Come on, Alicia said. I know you want to go on the roller coaster, but we agreed we'd scope it all out before we chose a ride. Kim sighed. That was true. This was their first time in the brand new Pizzaplex, and they'd agreed that checking out all their options first was the best thing to do. Giving in, Kim let her friends pull her along. As they flowed with the crowd, Kim used her index finger to keep track of what they were seeing. Her finger traced over a drawing of a costume closet. That was the Urban Legend Roleplay Auditorium. <laughs> this series is insane. The caption under the picture promised reality fun at its best. There's the entrance to the tubes, Eric said. He pointed at a neon archway just past the roleplay area. The arches opened up to a hallway painted with black and white pinwheels that looked like they were spinning. On the map, the climbing tubes looked like entwined snakes with smiley faces, and they were formed into a shape vaguely resembling an extensive castle with seemingly endless loops. This was Freddy's fortress. Kim shifted her gaze back to the real fortress entrance. She spotted a poster that featured a cute robot under the caption, Meet Haps, the friendly mascot of Freddy's fortress. Guys, it gets insane, I'm telling you. Uh, peering at the illustrated map, Kim spotted a tiny rubber shredded robot with big white hands inside one of the tubes. She smiled. After the roleplay venue and the climbing tubes, the map had a drawing of a tilter whirl made to look like Chica's cupcake with multiple arms and legs. As Kim and her friends passed it, the real tilter whirl zipped around. Uh, the whipping motion stirred the air, throwing Kim's long hair across her face. She brushed it back. A shout coming from her right caught Kim's attention. A crew of Pizzaplex workers were clustered around the AR booth, which stood between the tilter whirl and the theater in the middle of the Pizzaplex. Are you ready for this next line? Smoke filled the booth's glass enclosure. The crew appeared to be trying to pry the booth open. <laughs> Kim looked down at the map. On the map, the AR booth was depicted as a pristine, crystal-like globe of fantasy come to life. She had a feeling no fantasies would be coming to life in there today. She just hoped the AR booth was the only venue with problems. This is insane. Uh, <laughs> this is currently taking place at the same time as under construction, guys. It, I love this. I love this so much. It, it, it proves that... um. That under construction was all a simulation. Um, freaking, what was her name? Maya uh, died uh, in the game, and there was smoke in the in the dome. This is just so cool. Can we can we just like agree on that? Like, it is so cool that we're getting this um, this kind of clarification in future stories. It's crazy good. It's amazing. Alicia tried to grab uh, to drag Kim and the boys into the clothing and souvenir shop as they passed it. Alicia was a shopaholic and her mom gave her a massive allowance. When they left to the Pizzaplex later that day, Eric and Cole would probably be would probably be juggling multiple bags filled with every piece of Fazbear clothing available. Alicia thought the boys were pack mules and they never told her otherwise. No one but Alicia, however, wanted to go shopping now. Eric and Cole took her arms and steered her away from retail heaven. The group continued on. Just past the shops, the aromas of pizza sauce and cheese wafting from the main dining room enticed all four of them. Eric's stomach rumbled audibly and Cole complained that he was going to starve if they didn't eat now. Kim was tempted to give in to them because the pizza did smell amazing, but she knew it was a bad idea. Do you remember when we went on the octopus at the county fair after we had burgers? Kim asked her friends. The boys went pale, and Alicia laughed. Of course they remembered. Worrying around on a full stomach was never a good idea. Um, let's wait until after we do the rides, Eric said. Good thinking, Kim smiled as she looked down at the grinning Freddy Fazbear holding a pizza that marked the dining room on the map. 
a lot of these locations do appear in the other stories. I'm just saying that, like, um, I have analysed this a lot. They continued on. Wide-eyed, Kim and her friends passed the carousel. On the map, the carousel looked like a giant sombrero. Adorable caricatures of the Freddy's animatronic characters sat along the wide brim of the hat-like image. After the carousel, they passed the arcade. Eric started chattering about all the arcade games. Kim looked at the map and saw that Eric had the games listed, uh, that had the listed games memorized. Next to the arcade on the map, a drawing of two crossed laser guns indicated the laser tag arena. Cole pointed at the drawing. We're definitely going here. Finally, Kim saw the roller coaster line stretched out toward the main walkway and pulled her friends toward it. Okay, we've been around the whole pizza plex. She waved the map. The only thing left is the theater. She tapped a drawing of a fairy tale like a castle. She looked at the map again. Oh, and the little kids play area underneath it. Can we please go on the roller coaster now? Eric looked at the map. Are you sure that's everything? He tilted his head to look at the underside of the map. There's an index. Can I see it? Kim shrugged and handed Eric the map. He pushed his thick rimmed glasses up on his nose and rang a finger down his index. Um, Kim tapped her foot impatiently as she watched more kids lining up for the roller coaster. Exploring was fine, but she was ready to go on a ride. Come on, Eric. Kim tried to take back the map. Wait a second. Eric clung to the map. His nose wrinkled up in concentration as he flipped the map from one side to the other multiple times. What are you doing? Alicia asked. Eric held up the map and pointed at the index. There's something listed on the index that isn't on the map. He put his pudgy finger on one of the index listings. Kim read over his shoulder. Ballora's Fitness and Flex. Eric turned the map over and ran his finger over all the illustrated attractions, showing his friends that Ballora's Fitness and Flex wasn't de uh, depicted. It's not here, see? Cole frowned at the map. He's right, for a change. Eric elbowed Cole. Alicia looked around. Yeah, and we didn't see it when we circled the whole place either. Cole shrugged. Maybe it was planned, but wasn't included in the final construction. It's weird that they put it in the index, though. Eric said. Kim lost her patience. Whatever. She grabbed the map and stuck it in her jeans pocket. Come on, let's go on to the roller coaster. We'll check out Ballora's later. This time, no one argued, so Kim let her friends or Kim led her friends to the end of the line. The map was forgotten as they craned their necks to see the high tech cars they'd soon be riding. Five months earlier. <laughs> I love that little prologue that we had. We need that in more stories, honestly. I love how they introduce that and they introduce Ballora's Finnis and Flex. And uh, the rest of the story is going to be uh, following other characters. So, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Grady took one last look at the carousel as he checked the attraction off the to-do list on his clipboard. He felt eyes on him and looked up. A shiny painted wood foxy on the carousel seemed to be staring at Grady. Grady glared at the pirate fox and quickly slung his canvas service tool kit over his, um, over his shoulder and turned away. He knew it was silly, but he wasn't a big fan of the animatronic characters. He didn't like that they all had big teeth and they had a way of looking like they were planning something, something that wouldn't be good for humans. The truth was, Grady didn't love robots in general. Artificial intelligence had never seemed like a good idea to him. He didn't think it was good for robots to have much control. Giving Foxy one last I'm human and you're not so there glare, Grady strode out onto the black and white tiled floor of the Pizzaplex's main walkway. His footsteps reverberated through the empty entertainment centre. Grady started to whistle, but the building's cavernous space twisted the sound into an almost eerie wail. That's just too creepy, he thought. Actually, the whole domed facility kind of got to Grady. Although the Pizzaplex would soon be a place of fun and frivolity, at least according to the advertisements, right now it was just vast warehouse crammed full of dormant games and rides. Um, it reminded Grady of an abandoned amusement park or an empty circus tent. He had no trouble imagining ghosts lurking behind all the attractions. When Grady had first applied to Fazbear Entertainment, un answering an ad for a technician, he'd hoped for a nice cushy position at a computer terminal, preferably next to a window. He hated feeling pen penned in. 
he'd liked the idea of being a behind the scenes programmer. Unfortunately, the job was for a troubleshooter rather than a programmer. It was a hands-on position that required working directly with the Freddy's games, rides, and entertainment venues. That meant that Grady had to be bit here in the big silent pizzaplex day after day, preparing for its grand opening. And once the pizzaplex opened, Grady would be one of the maintenance techs. So much for that window with a view. Someone tapped Grady on the shoulder. He yelped and whirled around. Whoa, sorry Grady, I didn't mean to scare you. Grady relaxed when he saw one of his fellow technicians, Ronan, a big super fit guy with bushy black hair who looked more suited to be a bouncer than a techie. Grady shuffled his feet. You didn't scare me. He'd just been surprised. Like the way he'd been surprised to learn that Ronan's favourite pastime was knitting. The pizzaplex gave Grady the willies, but he wasn't actually scared of anything he'd seen so far. No matter what his imagination conjured, he knew there weren't any ghosts around here. Besides, the truth was that only one thing really scared Grady, and that one thing actually terrified him. Tate asked me to find you, Ronan said. He's ready to leave. Grady looked at his watch. We have ten minutes left on our shift. Ronan flushed and stuck his massive hands in his pockets. Yeah, that's what I told Tate, but he said that he... No, sorry. But he said that wasn't enough time to run a full test on anything. He said we should just come back in the morning and do the rest of the safety checks. You know I hate to argue with Tate, but about anything. Ronan grinned, but he kind of has a point. Grady frowned. But tomorrow's Saturday. My friends and I planned a whole day of gaming. I've already bought the pretzels and the chip and dip. <laughs> Grady looked up at Ronan. I would have invited you, but I knew you'd say no. Ronan might have looked like he could be an action movie star, but he hated violent video games of all kinds, and therefore wasn't up for Saturday raids. Ronan's rugged face crumpled, making him look like a scolded puppy. Sorry, he said. I'm working on a sweater for my cousin. No problem, Grady said. Heavy footsteps thudded toward Grady and Ronan. They both looked toward the laser tag arena which was tucked into a pool of darkness a hundred feet away. Tate jogged into view, his long blonde hair flying around his head. What are we waiting for? My girlfriend got two huge steaks and is waiting for me at the lake. We're going to fire up the barbecue. Come on, let's lock it up and get it out of here. Grady sighed. Tate was such a pain in the butt. Although Tate and Ronan were about Grady's age, Tate seemed to be stuck in high school. When Tate wasn't wearing his Fazbear Entertainment uniform, red shirt and black pants, he was always sporting Hawaiian shirts and knee-length shorts, even in the winter. He belonged on some tropical island, not in a landlocked state a thousand miles from the nearest beach. Tate was weird and annoying and bossy. However, if Grady was being honest, his real reason for disliking Tate was that the guy reminded Grady of someone from his past, someone he preferred to, to forget. I don't want to come back in the morning. Grady told Tate. Grady looked, at, Grady looked down his clipboard. He only had three attractions left to check. We only have a few more tests to do, Grady said. We can probably knock them out in an hour or two, at the most. I'd rather stay late than ruin my Saturday. Tate made a face. Well, I wouldn't. I'm ready to hit it. Come on. He punched Grady's shoulder and started to stride away. Grady didn't move. Ronan looked from Grady to Tate and back again, his brows furrowed. Tate realised no one was following and turned back. Seriously, dudes, let's go. I'm staying, Grady said. I'm not, Tate said. Ronan's brows rumpled even more. We're not supposed to split up, he said. And no one is ever supposed to be here alone. That's the protocol. It's starred and highlighted in the employee's manual. Tate quirked an eyebrow at Ronan. You read that thing? Didn't you? Ronan asked. Tate slipped his fingers dismissively. I skimmed it. That means he looked at the cover. Grady said. Ronan laughed. Ha ha ha, Tate mocked. But I do know about the protocol. It's on that poster in the locker room too. Posters, so he can read, Grady said. Ronan grinned. Whatever, Tate said. The point is that I'm leaving, and Ronan, you want to leave, so Grady has to leave. Ronan looked at Grady. Come on, Grady. He checked his watch. It's just two minutes to end, to, to end of shift now. Grady shook his head. I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay and finish up my round so I don't have to come back tomorrow. Tate sighed heavily. He slapped Ronan's arm, arm, then pointed at Grady. Pick him up, will you? We'll just carry him out of here. Then we'll lock him up and we can all go home. Ronan gave Tate a withering look. 
Tate blew out air, exasperated. That's it, I'm out of here. He looked at Ronan. And since you're my ride, you have to come too. Tate turned and strode away. Ronan again looked from Grady to Tate. Go ahead, Ronan, Grady said. I know you have your knitting club get-togethers on Friday evenings. I'll stay and finish my rounds. But, Ronan began. Grady patted Ronan's meaty shoulder. It's okay. I won't tell anyone I stayed alone, and if anyone finds out, I'll take the blame. Go. Ronan frowned. You're sure? I, I could stay so you aren't alone. Grady smiled. You're a good guy, Ronan, but no. Seriously. Go. I'll be fine. Ronan hesitated for another few seconds, and Grady had to shoo him away before he disappeared around the far side of the castle-like theatre, rising up from the middle of the pizzaplex. Grady exhaled and looked up. Stretching for 50 feet or so over the top of the employee area and administration offices, a massive two-way mirrored expanse looked out over the entire complex. A security station was behind the glass, but it wasn't functional yet. The exterior of the pizzaplex had an active security system, but no one was here to man it, and all the cameras were offline. Fazbear Entertainment was having some trouble with the internal computer network. Employee records were being kept in physical files because the system had dumped the data. It was kind of the dark ages, but apparently the programmers were working on it. A door slammed in the distance. Then the pizzaplex was silent. Grady turned in a circle and, ga and gazed at his dim surroundings. When the Pizzaplex opened in a few months, it wouldn't be so dim. Nearly every game and ride and attraction in the place was swathed in neon or LED lights. The place would be lit up like a carnival on steroids when it was in full swing. Lights would glow and flash on nearly every available surface. The Pizzaplex wouldn't be quiet in a few weeks either. An extensive network of speakers were wired throughout every venue in the place. When the Pizzaplex opened, multiple sources of music would vie with the roars and hums and dings of the rides and games. The shouts and laughter of families and the screams of little kids would fill in the gaps around the rest of the noise. Grady had no trouble imagining what he would, it would be like. Now, however, the only sound Grady could hear was the huff of his own breath, and the only lights on were the security lights. They cast anemic glows along the walkways and over the various attractions. During the day, if it, was if it was clear outside, the sun shone through the stained glass at the top of the dome ceiling. Today, however, wasn't clear. Plus, it was nearing dusk. Pretty soon, most of the Pizzaplex would be in shadows. The idea gave Grady the goosebumps, but again, it didn't actually scare him. As long as he had a way out of wherever he was, Grady was fine. But if he got locked inside, Grady shivered and quickly checked his pockets for the master keys he and every other technician carried. He exhaled when he felt their jagged metal edges and heard their comforting jangle. Okay, he was okay. Grady lifted his clipboard and looked at his list. Grady had two games left to check in the arcade, ski ball and, ho and hoops. After that, he just needed to test Ballora's fitness and flex. This shouldn't take too long. The arched entrance to the arcade was only 30 feet or so from the carousel. Grady hurried down the main aisle of the arcade and reached the long row of ski ball machines. They were painted in bright colours and they all watched over um, by painted wooden cutouts of Freddy's characters. According to Tate, machines number two and number five weren't working properly. Instead of fixing them, Tate had passed that on to the task of Grady. For the next several minutes, Grady creatively cursed Tate for his ineptitude. Grady had to check all the sensors and scoring switches before he found the problem in the ball controller. Tate was an idiot. Grady finished fixing both machines, then returned to the uh, first one to play a game. The techs were supposed to play the games to be sure they didn't have any glitches. It was one of the perks of the job. Unfortunately, Tate tended to concentrate on the playing part, and when there was a problem, he fobbed it off onto Grady or Ronan. Jerk. Grady played a game of skee-ball on both machines. They worked per perfectly. He turned off the skee-ball machines and picked up his toolkit. Taking his kit to the Chica Shots Hoops game, Grady performed a diagnostic on it, then turned it on so he could test it. The machine dinged and started blasting tinny 80s rock music. Several rubber balls that looked like round versions of the various Freddy characters' faces bounced down the slope to the front of the machine. Grady played a round and managed a score of 30. He'd only made 15 baskets. Grady's grandmother would be embarrassed for him. She was a whiz at this game. He and his gran often went to a small arcade not far from his neighbourhood. His gran was like a pro basketball player, putting up shot after shot so fast that she regularly scored between 160 and 200. She was a phenom. 
Grady shook his head and shut off the machine. His score didn't matter. The machine worked fine. It was time to move on to the last venue he had to check before he could go home and enjoy his weekend. He grinned as he packed up his kit and slung it over his shoulder. Ronan and Tate could come in on Saturday and work. Meanwhile, Grady would be home munching on pretzels and playing his favourite game with his online friends. When Grady turned away from the hoops game, he realised the arcade was even darker than it had been when he entered it. The sun was down. Only the weak security lights created a feeble path of light past the machines. Grady followed it to the main concourse through the pizzaplex. There, he paused and checked off ski ball and hoops from the list. He looked at his last task and sighed. All right, Ballora, he said. Here I come. The entrance to Ballora's Fitness and Flex was a relatively, by Fazbear Entertainment standards anyway, nondescript doorway tucked between the laser tag arena and the lineup area for the roller coaster. The arched doorway, unlike most of the brightly coloured light wrapped entryways in the pizzaplex, was made of natural polished wood and had a carved sign above it. Beyond the doorway, a red painted hallway sloped downward and led to a long flight of stairs with alternating black and white steps. Ballora's was one of two venues tucked under the main level of pizzaplex. Of the pizzaplex, sorry. I'm stupid. Um, the other venue was only partly underground, a portion of Freddy's Fortress, the network of climbing and sliding pipes that snaked throughout the entertainment centre, uh, was also below ground. Grady knew this from the planning memos he and the other techs were required to read. Thankfully, he'd never, he never had to check out the pipes. According to the specs he'd read, a maintenance robot, HAPS, was designed to keep the pipes safe. But Grady didn't want to be the one to test it out. He didn't want to leave his safety in the hands of newly built robotics. Grady paused at the base of the stairs. He frowned. Wasn't that what he was doing? What, sorry, wasn't that what he was going to be doing in Ballora's Fitness and Flex? A shudder skidded down um, Grady's spine. He so didn't want to do this. Forcing himself to get going again, Grady followed the now yellow hallway around a long curve until he reached the big arched entrance to the fitness center. Here, the LED lights and neon were in evidence again. Although, they weren't on, of course. The thinner centre was nothing but a darkened moor. Grady cleared his throat and stepped through the arch. Using the muted security lights to find the main control panel for the centre, he opened the panel and flipped the switches to turn on all the lights in the area. Shining red neon and yellow LED lights... Showing? Did I say showing? I... I was supposed to say shining, I think I said showing. Shining red neon and yellow LED lights blinked on. White spotlights flooded the space with a nearly blinding glow. Grady took a deep breath and surveyed the venue he'd most dreaded working on. He tried to ignore the fact that he was shaking. Ballora's Fitness and Flex was an exercise venue different from anything Grady had seen before. Like a climbing wall, it was a vertical attraction. The starting platform was 50 feet up in the air, reached by a long ladder. An intricate series of serpentine tubes led from the platform to the floor. The tunnels were made of clear plastic and they were tapered from a couple feet wide at the top to what appeared to be barely wide enough for a teenager to squeeze through at the bottom. All of them were visible behind the transparent wall that enclosed them. Grady shivered. It looked like an ant farm. The idea behind the venue, Grady knew, was to force participants to wriggle and pull themselves through the tight spaces, requiring them to twist and turn and stretch themselves th around the curves of the tunnels to get to the bottom. All this physical activity was designed to provide aerobic strengthening and flexibility conditioning, and theoretically a lot of fun. Grady was more than sceptical about the fun. I was about to say, I, I don't know how this was, like, approved. <laughs> like, this... This clearly has dangers to it. There are clearly liabilities to this. It was a creative idea, Grady had to admit, but it was still exercise. Grady hated exercise. One sec. Hmm. When Grady, Ronan and Tate... Ugh. When Grady, Ronan and Tate had first sat down to divvy up the list of attractions that needed to be tested, Grady had taken a hard pass on Ballora's. My idea of exercise is walking from my gaming chair to my fridge. He said, does it sound like I'm the right person to test a fitness center? Tate had lifted a brow and cocked his head as if conceding the point. But then he gestured at Ronan. I don't think Mr. Universe here could make it through the narrow tunnels. Ronan had nodded. Unfortunately, it's designed more for kids and ordinary size adults. Grady had pointed at Tate. What about you? Tate tossed up his hands in insincere apology. Bad knees, I'm afraid. 
And I'm a lot taller than you are. It makes the most sense for you to do it. Grady had shaken his head. I hate small spaces. He realised as soon as he said the words that they'd come out in a whiny voice, as if his five-year-old self had piped up to protest. He cleared his throat. Tate poked Ronan in the shoulder. I bet Ronan's not a fan of them either, since he doesn't fit in them. Tate chuckled. Jesus. <laughs> it had taken every ounce of will Grady had not to launch himself across the table they'd sat at and wrap his hands around Tate's throat. When Grady had faced off with the Tate lookalike from his past, he'd been too young to do anything but cry. Now he was bigger, and he could have throttled Tate if he didn't mind going to jail. Grady shook his head, bringing himself back to Ballora's fitness and flex. His legs suddenly felt shaky. Grady sat down, cross-legged, on the bright yellow tiled floor and pulled out a candy bar he'd stashed in his, in his toolkit under the needle-nosed pliers. They weren't supposed to eat on the job. Food was only allowed in the employee break room. But to heck with the rules. When Grady got hungry, he needed to eat. And when he got scared, Grady unwrapped the bar and bit into the chocolate and nougat. He immediately felt his anxiety ease. Food had always been his comfort. It was amazing, Grady thought. How patterns established in childhood stayed with you through to... Ad I completely butchered that. How patterns established in childhood stayed with you into adulthood. Grady was almost 28 years old, and his daily reactions were nearly all dictated by experiences he had when he was little. The food, for example, and his biggest fear. Grady choked on his next bite of candy as he looked up at the meandering tunnels in front of him. He felt a trickle of sweat run down his slide. Slide. His side. Oh my gosh. Today I'm just so bad at reading. I'm so sorry. I, I mean, I've been doing this for three days straight, so I guess you have to consider that when you when you roast me in the comments anyway uh grady closed his eyes he tried to calm his breathing it had been just one evening of his life six hours and 13 minutes that was all grady did the math in his head of the roughly 15 million minutes he'd been alive the 373 minutes of his ordeal was just an infinitesimal percentage of the totality of his experience but the impact of it that was another story when Grady was little, his parents had loved to dance. They didn't dance much now. His dad had slipped discs, and his mum had never fully really recovered from a broken ankle. But 23 years ago, at least three or four times a week, Grady's parents had gone to a dance studio to practice for amateur dance contests. This meant Grady was left with a lot of babysitters. It wasn't like Grady's parents were bad parents or anything. When she wasn't dancing, his mum stayed home and took care of him. He always had milk and cookies waiting for him when he got home from school, and she usually took him to the park or let him have a play date before dinner. His dad worked a normal 9 to 5, and he played with Grady during the evenings. He and Grady's mum weren't out dancing. They weren't neglectful. They just weren't that discerning when it came to choosing babysitters, at least not that one night. Grady's regular babysitter hadn't been available. They'd had to hire a girl they'd never used before. She'd been recommended by a friend, but it turns out the friend wasn't a very attentive mother and didn't really care who was taking care of her kid. Frances seemed nice enough when she'd arrived that night. She was cute and perky and she smiled at Grady and asked him about the tower of blocks he was building in front of the fireplace. She told him that they'd play a lot of fun games while his parents were out. Right after his parents had left, Frances had made him a peanut butter sandwich. Grady had been halfway through his sandwich when the doorbell rang. Grady had heard Francis's delighted giggle when she opened the door. He'd wondered what she was so happy about. He hoped he'd be happy about it too. But he wasn't. When Francis had returned to the living room, she had a teenage boy in tow. The boy, dressed in baggy shorts and a flowery floppy shirt, was tall and skinny, and he had scraggly long, long blonde hair. Thinking about it now, Grady thought it was uncanny how much Tate resembled the boy who had showed up that night. The boy even had Tate's cocky grin, but when he arrived that evening, he hadn't bothered using the grin on Grady. As soon as he spotted Grady, the boy gave Grady a dismissive glance and then grabbed Francis and kissed her. Grady had looked away. He didn't like to watch kissing. This is Boone, Francis had told Grady. Boone, this is Grady. Boone had ignored Grady and kissed Francis again. When Francis had giggled and, and half-pushed Boone away, she didn't look like she really meant it. Boone had looked down at Grady. You like hide and seek, kid? Boone had asked. Grady, 
working to get peanut butter off the roof of his mouth, nodded eagerly. Good, Boone had said. Then, weirdly, Boone had disappeared down the hall. Grady didn't know much at five years old, but he knew it wasn't nice to wander around someone else's house. He'd once tried to do that when his mum took, took him with her to visit a friend. When Grady wandered off to explore the unfamiliar surroundings, his mum had called him back. It's not polite to look around other people's houses without their permission, she'd told him. That was what Boone was doing. Grady could hear Boone opening and closing doors. Grady was going to tell on Boone when his mum got home. Boone finally returned, and when he did, he held out a hand. He finally smiled at Grady. Grady jumped up, forgetting all about Boone's bad behaviour. Grady was ready to play. Boone took Grady's hand and led him out of the living room. Grady wasn't sure what was going to happen next because hide and seek didn't usually start with hand holding, but he went along with Boone. Uh, where he went along when Boone walked down the hall to the linen closet. When he when they got to the closet, Boone opened the closet door. Before Grady could react, Boone shoved Grady under the bottom shelf in the closet. You hide there, Boone had said. The area under the bottom shelf wasn't big and it wasn't empty. His mum kept packages of toilet paper tucked under the shelf. There was barely enough room for Grady to squeeze in next to the puffy rolls. Grady opened his mouth to ask how Grady could win the game if Boone already knew where he was hiding. He didn't get the words out though. Boone didn't give him a chance. Boone shut the door, leaving Grady in the tiny dark space. Now, Boone said, his voice muffled by the door. We can seek some fun times, Boone laughed, and Francis giggled. Grady had immediately kicked at the door. Hey, he called, let me out. Boone's laugh and Francis's giggle answered his cry. Both the laugh and the giggle came from further away. Grady called out to them again. When they didn't answer, he tried to reach up in front of the shelf to turn the doorknob. His arm was skinny, but the space between the shelf and the door was even skinnier. Grady started to cry as the edge of the wood shelf scraped at his bare arm. He cried even harder when he realised he couldn't reach high enough to grasp the doorknob. Grady tried to pull his arm back down, but he couldn't. It was stuck. That's when Grady started screaming, and that's when the 373 minutes started. The fact that Grady was able to count to 373 at the age of five was pretty amazing, his parents later told him. At the time, though, he had no idea he was doing something clever, clever. and whenever he thought about it later, he'd wished he hadn't had to do it. Are you kidding me? He was in there for over six hours? No way. That's like a quarter of a day. <laughs> it, it is. It is a quarter of a day. Oh my gosh. Grady knew it was 373 minutes because he'd just learned to tell the time a week before. And his parents had given him a big orange watch. Oh, okay. I thought he was just sat there, like, counting the seconds. Like, one, two... Um... Yeah, and his parents had given him a big orange watch, the kind with an old-fashioned clock face, not the kind with just numbers, as a reward for how fast he'd learned. The watch had a glow-in-the-dark hands, so he could see the time at night. Thanks to those hands, Grady could see the minutes going by, even in the near darkness of the closet. After his initial panic, Grady had managed to change his position and pull his arm down a little, but he couldn't get it completely unstuck. Later, when he was older, he reasoned that his arm had swollen when it got scraped and bruised on the way up. When he was five though, all he knew was that his arm really hurt and he was trapped in the dark, and he was terrified. The air in the linen closet smelled like his mother. It was really flowery and sweet. It wasn't a bad smell, but it made Grady's nose itch and it reminded him of his mother, who wasn't here to help him. Somehow smelling her, but knowing she wasn't there made everything worse. Grady screamed and screamed and screamed. He was so, so, so scared. Why wouldn't Boone and Francis let him out? No matter how much he shrieked, they didn't come. Grady screamed for 62 of the 373 minutes. Eventually, though, the screams and the fact that the peanut butter had made him thirsty closed up his throat. From that point, he could only concentrate on trying to breathe. By then, his nose was stuffed up from crying. He couldn't get a full breath of air. He thought he was going to die. Grady didn't remember a lot about his ordeal from that point on. The only thing he could remember well was watching the big hand of his orange-faced clock move from one minute mark to the next. According to Grady's mother, she and Grady's dad had come home about half an hour earlier than they said they would. They'd found Francis and Boone asleep on the couch together. When Boone had finally admitted where he'd stashed Grady, the boy had been barely conscious. 
Grady hadn't spoken for days after that. Grady never found out exactly what happened to Francis and Boone. He just knew his parents said they were pressing charges. At the time, Grady wasn't sure what it meant, but he hoped it hurt Francis and Boone a lot. When all was said and done, the only injury Grady got from his time in the closet was a sprained wrist and a sore throat, but the unseen damage was the real problem. He was in therapy for months before he'd let anyone close his bedroom door. He even had issues with his parents closing and locking the doors to the house, and the car was worse. Soon, any enclosed small space was a problem. Those months had been hard on Grady and his parents. Sometimes they acted like they felt guilty about what had happened, and sometimes they acted exasperated by Grady's problems. The only good thing Grady could remember about those months was that his parents let him eat a lot of food they'd never let him have before. They'd brought him whatever candy or chips or whatever junk food he'd wanted. The food had distracted him from his fears. Recently, Grady's mum had told him it was her fault that he was addicted to uh, junk food. She'd been so relieved when he'd sit in front of the TV and eat instead of freaking out about closed doors uh, she'd, that she'd let him eat as much of it as she wanted. By the time Grady had graduated from high school, Grady still loved junk food, but he was reasonably functional in most situations. He could manage small rooms and cars as long as he knew he had a way to get out. Grady blinked and looked at his candy wrapper. It was empty. He checked his watch. Ten minutes had passed. He took a shaky breath. It had been a long time since he'd let himself think about being locked in a linen closet. Of course, he'd think of it now. He looked up at the narrow, squiggly tubes. He shuddered. Maybe he could just say that he tested it. Grady pulled up the candy wrapper and sighed. No, he couldn't do that. It wouldn't make for a good story. <laughs> um, kids were going to be in those tubes. If they were defective in any way, it was Grady's job to find the defects and fix them. He wasn't going to be re responsible even partly for anyone going through a trauma like he did when he was stuck in the closet. Grady tucked his candy wrapper in his kit and zipped the kit's top closed. He looked at it. The toolkit wasn't going to do him much good here. If something was wrong with Ballora herself, he could use the tools to fix her. But to find out um, whether she functioned properly, he'd have to go through the tubes. It was going to be hard enough to squeeze his body through them without bringing his toolkit along. Grady left it on the floor and stood. He brushed himself off and steeled himself for what he had to do. Finally, Grady walked over to the ladder. He might as well get it over with. Grady grasped the smooth, rounded sides of the ladder and placed his foot on the first rung. He looked down at the step and was pleased to see that it was wide and had a tread for gripping the bottom of the shoes. He held onto the sides of the ladder and leaned his weight backward. The ladder didn't move at all. It was sturdy. Good. Grady tilted his head back and looked up. His resolve wavered. The ladder was, ve was tall, very tall. From this perspective, it looked like it went up and up forever. Grady could barely see the top. Grady let go of the ladder and wiped his suddenly sweaty palms on the front of his shirt. He took a deep breath and grasped the ladder again. Before he let himself think anymore, he began climbing. After only a dozen or so rungs, Grady was winded. After... or winded. Winded, probably. Uh, after another dozen, sweat had beaded on his forehead. After another dozen, he was gasping. He had to stop. He clung to the ladder, gulping in air. Grady looked up. He wasn't too far from the top, but his legs felt like jelly and his knees were throbbing. He snorted at the thought of Tate's bad knees. Silently cursing his co-worker, Grady ground his teeth. Grady's annoyance gave him a burst of energy. He took in a deep breath and started climbing again. This time, he forced himself to keep going until he reached the top. When Grady crawled onto the broad rubber-floored platform at the top of the network of tubes, he was once again sucking in air. He used his shirt to wipe off his sweat-soaked face. Grady looked at the array of tubes extending downward from the platform. He had to admit they looked plenty big enough for him to get through. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad. It was just 50 feet from the top of the tube network to the floor. It wouldn't take that long to get through it. Grady craned his neck to examine the path of the tube nearest him. He frowned. Maybe it would take longer than he thought. The only problem was that the tubes didn't just go straight down. They bent left and right and looped around, crisscrossing with other tubes, backtracking and zigzagging. The travel distance from the platform to the floor would have to be at least three or four times longer than just 50, 50 feet. Grady heaved a loud sigh. The sound seemed to swell around him, mocking him for his hesitation. Are you a man or a mouse? Grady asked himself. 
He immediately laughed. It would be better if he was a mouse at this point. Too bad he couldn't turn himself into one so he could scurry through the tubes double time and get this done. <laughs> um, come on, Grady, he urged himself. Move it. Grady edged toward the nearest tube. He peered into the opening. Still, he hesitated. He was just getting ready to bend down into the tube when a click and a whoosh startled him into immobility. He whipped his head around and watched, wide-eyed, as the torso of Ballora, the animatronic mascot of the fitness venue, popped out of a hole in the platform. Her long eyelashes fluttered as she turned her metal head and aimed her purple eyes at Grady. Hello, hello, welcome here, Ballora sang in a sweet yet raspy woman's voice. It's time to play. Nothing to fear. Can I just say right now, like already, this story is a lot better than Dance With Me, or at least what Dance With Me did with Ballora, because I, I feel like even though I think Dance With Me is actually quite a good story compared to a lot of what other people think, um, I, I, I know that Ballora wasn't really used to her fullest potential because Ballora is scary, man. Like, Ballora is genuinely one of the scariest animatronics, I would say, in the series. She's just very creepy and her voice is creepy. It should be utilized. Her face, like, just the fact that she's, like, more human than a lot of the other animatronics makes her more scary. And I don't think she was utilized very well in Dance With Me. But here we are getting her up close and personal and I love this. Um... Ballora's little ditty was in minor key and dropped down at the end of each phrase. Oh god, I gotta try and do that. Uh, it in no way reassured him. Grady found it kind of haunting. Ballora spun in a circle and faced Grady again. I'm happy you're here. Oh god, that's so terrible. I'm happy you're here, she purred. I will help you get fit. This time, she didn't sing. She just spoke. Grady liked that better. I also like that better because it means I don't have to sing. Uh, Grady had only seen sketches of Ballora before now. She was much more impressive in person. Ballora was an animatronic designed to look like a ballerina. In the sketches Grady had seen, Ballora wore a, a blue leotard and tutu. But this version of Ballora was just her upper body. Oh my gosh, that's horrifying. Which was attached to a robot mechanism that moved her through the exercise venue. She was pretty in a weirdly robotic way. Ballora had blue hair caught up in a bun and held with what looked like a fan-shaped flamenco dancer-style comb. All of this was actually painted metal. Like most of Fazbear Entertainment's animatronics, Ballora had more teeth than Grady thought were necessary. However, the teeth were tempered somewhat by the pink blush on Ballora's sculpted cheeks. Ballora's endoskeleton was made of a combination of metal and thick rubber encased wires arranged to resemble musculature. Her limbs were articulated so she could move with the grace of a dancer. In most of the sketches, Ballora stood with her arms lifted gracefully over her head, but right now they were thrown out to her sides as if making a grand welcoming gesture. I encourage you to slide on in, Ballora began singing again. That's the best way to begin. Grady really didn't like Ballora's tune. Stop singing, Grady said. I don't like the singing. He was going to have to make a note of the tune to the programmers. It was far too sinister. Ballora spun again. Her sovos whirred, and when she stopped, Grady heard a metallic clink. He wondered if that was normal. He'd make a note of that too. Please try a tube, Ballora said. I'm here to help you get to the bottom. Yeah? Grady asked doubtfully. What can you do to help? I'm here to make sure you don't get stuck. Sorry, I, I, I don't know why I started that so quickly. I'm here to make sure you don't get stuck. That word made the little hairs at the back of Grady's neck stand upright. He felt them bristle against his skin. She just had to go and say the word stuck. This was, of course, Grady's biggest fear. Grady's heart pounded. It was taking everything he had not to scramble back to the ladder and flee from the fitness center. Maybe he should just quit his job. Yeah, and pay the rent with what? It had taken him months to find this job, and it was a good one. Besides, if he didn't test the tubes, who would? Please give it a try, Ballora said in her soothing voice. You can do it. Grady looked at Ballora. You promised to get me out if I get stuck? What was he thinking? An animatronic couldn't make promises. Now wasn't a good time for Grady to change his robots-can't-be-trusted mantra. 
Did he really want to count on this mass of metal and wires and chips? Chips programmed by some misguided designer who thought horror movie music would be encouraging to someone about to crawl into a tiny tube? I'll help you if you get stuck, Ballora assured him. Should he believe her? Uh, absolutely not. Did he have a choice if he was going to do his job right? No matter what Grady thought of the animatronics, this one had to be tested. The only way to test her was to crawl into the tube. Okay, fine, Grady said. I'm going. Ballora spun again, and again her spin ended in a sharp clinking sound. Grady used the sound as a sort of starting gun. He crawled headfirst into the closest tube. Grady was glad the tubes were clear. It made it easier not to feel trapped. Grady could see the way below him, and he could see the floor down beneath the tubes. He could even see the small square of black that had to be his toolkit. That black square was his true north. It was his goal, and he wanted to get to it as fast as he could. Stretching out his arms and putting his hands together as if he was about to dive into a swimming pool, Grady slid through the tube. Gravity sucked him downward, and for a few breathless seconds, Grady was sure he was going to slip all the way to the ground. He felt pressure in his head, as if he was doing a headstand. And he supposed he was, in a way. Once, when Grady was little, an older cousin picked Grady up and hung him upside down by his feet. Being in this tube was a little like that. Grady could feel all the blush rub to his head, neck and shoulders. It didn't feel good. The few seconds of sliding came to an abrupt end. Grady's hands, outstretched beneath his head, encountered the first turn. Now he couldn't slide. He had to squirm. At the turn, although it was wide enough for his body, Grady had to strain to manoeuvre around the corner. It was hard work. He had to push off with his knees and feet and use the power of his shoulders, what little they had, to propel himself downward. One thing Grady could confirm already was that Ballora's fitness and flex lived up to his name. Working his way through the tubes was challenging. He could feel the tendons of his lower legs stretching, and he could feel his joints protesting motions they weren't used to. Already he was contorting his body into positions it had never gotten into before. Grady grunted and panted as, and as he army crawled back and forth, but always downward, along the slick surface of the tube. He noted that the plastic sleekness was very helpful. Getting through the tube would have been far more difficult if the surface had been made of anything that gripped. It also helped that Grady was sweating like he'd run a mile in 100 degree heat. He could feel perspiration saturating his uniform shirt, and more than once, drops of sweat fell from his nose. When he, he, when he inhaled, he smelled his fetid body odour. That was something else he could notate in his report. What steps would be taken to make sure these tubes didn't reek like a boy's locker room? Surely, Grady wouldn't be the only one to sweat inside these tight spaces. Grady squirmed and skidded. He flexed, and he pulled. Twice, he conked his head when he tried to lift his upper body to get more speed in his glide. Several times, he whacked his elbows. He had a feeling there had to be a more graceful way to get through this sinuous maze. Maybe instruction pamphlets would be passed out before anyone got into the tubes. He imagined that instructions were given to climbers before they tried to scale a wall. The same should be true for these tunnels. Not everyone was a natural-born spelunker. Because he hadn't noted precisely what time he'd gotten into the tube, Grady didn't know exactly how long he'd struggled down through the winding, narrow shafts before he popped out of a tube opening and dropped onto what was marked as Checkpoint 1. The checkpoint was a small platform with enough headspace for Grady to sit upright. Phew! Grady said loudly as he wormed around on the platform and shifted onto his butt. He stretched his legs out in front of him and flexed his feet. His ankles weren't happy with him. Neither was the rest of his body. He ached in places he didn't even know he had. Grady wiped his face with the bottom of his shirt. It didn't help much. His shirt was as damp as his face. He swiped his, his, at his eyes. His salty sweat was making them burn. Once his eyes were clear, Grady looked around the small enclosure. Unlike the starting platform, which had been open air, this one was inside the tube. Although it was more spacious than the tubes Grady had just gone through, it was still confined. There was no way out of it except up or down through the tubes. Grady tried not to think about how the platform's size resembled the floor of the linen closet. When his breathing quickened, he looked through the transparent plastic walls to remind himself the large room beyond the tube network was right there, just on the other side of the see-through wall. He'd be back in the open space soon. 
Squiddy noticed a small plaque under the checkpoint sign. He scooted closer so he could read it. You are one third of the way to the bottom. Congratulations. One third? Grady dropped his head into his hands. He'd thought this was the halfway point. He looked down and shook his head. Idiot, he admonished himself. He was clearly not halfway down. And why would it be checkpoint one if the next stop was the bottom? It would just be plain old checkpoint, or even halfway point. Wishful thinking, he muttered. Grady licked his lips. He was really thirsty, and he wished he had some water. He figured he should add that to his list of notes. People would get thirsty in here. Maybe there should be a drinking fountain in each of the checkpoint platforms. Not that they'd do that now. The thing was built. They weren't going to tear it apart to add plumbing to it. Grady, however, thought this was a major design flaw. If only they'd had someone like him plan the venue. Then again, if he'd planned it, it wouldn't exist. He wouldn't have come up with something this diabolical in a million years. And speaking of a million years, if he didn't want to spend that much time in here, he should get moving. Grady got up on his knees and peered into the next section of tubing. When he did, his breath caught in his throat. The tube he looked into was narrower than the one he'd just crawled through. He investigated a couple more tubes opening off the platform. All were smaller than what he'd already been through. Great. Just great. Grady rotated and dropped his head back to look up to the tube he'd just come out of. Maybe he could climb back to the top and be done with it. The distance would be half of what he'd have to do if he kept going. Did he really need to test the whole thing? He'd already discovered its design flaws. Maybe he'd done enough. He could just wriggle his way back up to the platform. Yeah, but it's going up, dummy, he told himself. He'd barely managed to work himself through the tube going downhill. How would he pull himself up? Grady sat back on his haunches and slumped against the plastic wall of the checkpoint. He had to face facts. He didn't have the strength to climb up through the tunnels. As awful as the idea was, it would be easier to just keep going downward. Grady took a deep breath. Come on, he urged himself. Get on with it. Inching forward, Grady pushed his head and then his upper body down into the closest tube. Although the fit in this tube was definitely tighter than the one in the last one Grady had been in, he could move through it. It was really tough going, though. Whereas before Grady could push himself off the walls of the tube, here there was barely enough space for him to be inside the tube, much less try to contort himself into anything other than a flattened position. He had very little wriggle room. Instead of using his elbows as treads, he, used, he had to keep his arms out in front of him and sort of writhe from side to side like an eel moving through water. This is, like, this isn't, this doesn't sound scary, but just the thought of it is scary. I don't know if, uh, like, I'm articulating that very well, but, like, this genuinely is quite chilling. Like, my gosh, imagine being stuck in these tubes. There, there is literally nothing you can do. There's, there is nothing you can do. You're going down these tubes that are getting smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner um, down the bottom. You can either try and climb back up, which isn't going to be very possible because, you know, they are small tubes and like trying to squirm your way up is going to be really difficult. And uh, the only way you can go is downward. But going downward means it's going to get more difficult and you're going to get stuck at some place. And uh, that's probably what's going to happen here. Uh, I don't know. I actually can't remember a lot of the story, so I, the only part of the story I really remember is the start, so uh, you're getting kind of a bit of a reaction from me as well. Uh, anyway, if only he was moving through water. The first few bends in this narrow tube weren't too bad. Again, Grady's perspiration helped him out. He sort of slithered along the plastic. The first abrupt turn in the tube, however, was an issue. It arced back in the opposite direction, requiring Grady to bend almost double to get around it. And when he bent in the middle, the tube narrowed even more. He was, just as he'd most feared, stuck. Grady sucked in his gut and jiggled himself back side to side. He wrenched himself back and forth. Nothing worked. He wasn't budging. If he'd had something to grab onto, he might have been able to yank himself downward. But when he tried to grip the tube's surface, his hand slipped. His sweat wasn't in his favour now. Grady thrashed for several minutes. Finally, uh, sorry, Grady thrashed for several minutes, getting more and more freaked out. Finally, he screamed, Help! He had no idea why he was screaming. He was alone in the pizzaplex. Not a soul could hear him. No, wait, what about Ballora? In his panic, Grady had forgotten about the animatronic helper. Ballora, he called out. Help! I want out! When nothing happened immediately after his yell, Grady screamed again. Help me! 
He was just starting to berate himself for the stupidity of trusting a robot when he heard a humming rumble coming along the tube below him, a clank sounded just a few feet from him, and then Ballora's torso snapped into view a couple feet below Grady's head. He twisted his neck to look at her. Ballora blinked her purple eyes at him and flustered her lashes. She spun in a circle and smiled wide enough for him to see all her teeth. Grady's overtaxed muscles quivered. His imagination was providing him with the alarming image of Ballora using her teeth to... Don't give up now. Sorry, <laughs> that was really bad. Uh, Don't give up now, Ballora encouraged. You can do it. Twisting through the tunnels is good for flexibility. I'm stuck, Grady yelled. How can I twist through the tunnels if I'm stuck? He once again attempted to unwedge himself from the turn in the tube. After a few seconds, he glared at Ballora. See? Ballora did another spin and started to sing, I'm so very happy to tell... Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, you must be getting very annoyed at this. <laughs> I'm so very happy to help you. I'm here to get you through. What did I say about the singing? Grady growled. Stop singing! Ballora held out her hands. Here, let me help you. Grady wasn't keen on giving Ballora control over him, which she'd have if he let her take his hands. But what choice did he have? Besides, Ballora was programmed to help people make it through the fitness tubes. Grady had seen her specs. She'd get him out of his predicament. Grady stretched his arms down so Ballora could take his hands. Ballora grabbed them. As soon as Ballora's metal fingers uh, closed over Grady's softer ones, she clamped down. Her grip pinched his knuckles. Ow! Grady complained. Ballora ignored him. She started skimming downward through the tube, her systems thrumming deeply. The sound vibrated the tube's plastic walls. Ballora didn't go too fast, but even so, when she tugged, Grady thought his arms were going to come out of their sockets. Su sharp pain surged through his shoulders as she yanked them forward. That hurts, Grady exclaimed. Ballora still ignored him. She kept moving down smoothly and gracefully, and as she glided easily through the tube, Grady jerked and lurched along above her. With just one snatch, Ballora had Grady free of the turn that had seized him. However, that turn was only one of many that lay between where Grady had gotten stuck and the next checkpoint. This tube didn't seem to have any straight stretches at all. It was all twist, turn, twist, turn, loop, bend, and twist, turn. Ballora, however, had no trouble manoeuvring through the tight spaces, and she had no problem dragging Grady along with her. It was Grady who was having the trouble. The whole procedure hurt like hell. Human arms weren't designed to be used as tow ropes. Grady was certainly getting through the compact space, but at what cost? After just a few tugs, Grady's shoulders were on fire. Ow, ow, ow! He chanted as Ballora hauled him along. Following several more twists and turns, Grady's owls turned into groans and moans, and his groans quickly turned into screams. The pain in his shoulders began spreading. It radiated down his arms and up through his neck. This is what the rack must have felt like, Grady thought, during one particularly gruelling turn. His eyes were filled with tears, his breath came fast, and he was getting nauseous. The pain was unlike anything he'd ever felt before. Stop! Grady finally shrieked. Stop it! Almost there, Ballora sang out. Grady gritted his teeth and closed his eyes. He focused on his breathing, in and out and in and out. After a few breaths, Grady found himself on another small platform. They'd reached checkpoint two. Like checkpoint one, it was just a small platform enclosed within the tube. Ballora let go of Grady's hands and he immediately hugged himself. He sobbed in relief and in continued torment. Just because Ballora had stopped pulling on him didn't mean Grady felt better. His shoulders were screaming bloody murder. Grady rubbed his shoulders and rocked back and forth. He snivelled like a little kid. It hurts, he moaned. Ballora did not reply. She did not reply because she was gone. As soon as Ballora got Grady to the second checkpoint, she disappeared. Thank all the gods and goddesses in all the lands. Grady breathed out one of the RPG lines as he gingerly tried to raise and lower his arms. He winced at the twinges of hot pain that pulsed in his shoulders. He screwed up his face. He'd probably torn a rotator cuff or something. Grady half smiled. Now that he was sitting up and wasn't being stretched like human taffy, his sense of humour had returned. He found it funny that he might have an injury common to the athletes. Grady had never thought he'd tear a rotator cuff. It was far more likely that he'd get a carpal tunnel from too much time at the computer. 
Hey, I wonder if this will make me more appealing to women, he said out loud. He laughed at the idea. Was his laugh just a tad maniacal? Maybe. He decided to stop being funny. Not that he was being all that funny anyway. Grady leaned back against the platform wall. He continued rubbing his shoulders. After a couple minutes, he looked down at the next set of tubes. He trembled. He really didn't think he could go through anything like that again. And what if the next time Ballora pulled so hard she did wrench his arms free of their sockets? She was a robot. She certainly had the strength to do that. No, Grady wasn't going back in the tubes. He would wait right here on the platform. And in the morning, when Ronan and Tate saw that Grady's reports weren't filed, they checked the venues he was supposed to test. They'd find him, and they'd get him out of here. Grady shifted positions. The burning in his shoulders was lessening, a little. Grady realised his face was smeared with tears and wiped them away. He sniffled, wishing he had something to blow his nose on. He also wished, again, that he had some water and some food. Grady looked around at the platform. He frowned. Just how would they get him out of here? He closed his eyes and tried to remember the specs for Ballora's fitness and flex. Did the tunnel network have an emergency exit? Not that Grady could remember. He was pretty sure no one had expected someone to get stuck in the tubes. He guessed the designer assumed Ballora would be able to do her job and get people out. Clearly, the designer was a complete fool. Did it not occur to the... <laughs> Did it not occur to that jabroni that Ballora might do the kind of damage she'd done to Grady? Dingus, Grady muttered. When he got out of here, he was going to have a few words for whoever had come up with his concept after everyone stopped laughing at him. Oh man, Grady moaned. They were going to laugh at him. He could just hear the comments. He'd be the laughing stock of Fazbear Entertainment. Grady closed his eyes and dropped his head into his hands. He was going to end up like poor Hank. A month before, Hank, one of the engineers, had taken the tilter whirl for a spin, and it had gotten stuck at high speed. By the time the other engineers figured out how to shut it down, Hank had spewed his entire lunch all over the ride. Somehow, the press heard about the incident, and they did a front <laughs> they did a front page story with the headline "Fazbear Entertainment Employee Tilter Hurls." <laughs> People were still bringing ha Hank bath bags on a daily basis. Ah, Grady shook his head. No way did he want to be the famous butt of a bunch of jokes about how he was too large to get through the fitness centre. No, Grady couldn't just sit here and wait it out. He had to keep going. Grady leaned forward so he could see the floor. The black square of his toolkit was bigger than it had been the last time he'd seen it from the upper platform. That gave Grady hope. It wasn't much further. Surely he could make it. But what if it got even worse? Grady's muscles bunched up at the idea of being stuffed into a space even smaller than what he'd just gone through. Grady leaned down and looked into the last set of tunnels. Some of his tension abated a little. The tunnels below Grady didn't seem to be any smaller than the ones above him. If he got through those, he could get through these, right? Yeah, but the only reason he got through the previous tubes was because Ballora had dragged him through them. What made him think he could do it on his own? Grady looked down at his stomach. He drew in, sorry, he drew it in as flat as he could get it. Would it be enough to get him through to the end? It had to be. Grady got up on his knees. He rubbed his shoulders one last time. He took de several deep breaths. Then he blew out all the air he could and dropped head first into the next tube. The first few feet of the final section weren't too bad. Yes, blood still rushed to his head. Yes, he still felt the pressure in his head and shoulders. But still, Grady was heartened. He was on the last stretch. He could do this. It was going to be okay. Grady inched his way down through the tunnel, making sure he kept his breath as slow and even as possible, moving in tiny increments so he didn't get himself wedged in any of the turns. Grady forced himself not to think about where he was and what could happen, and instead concentrated on waggling his body back and forth, like the tail of a happy dog. That motion seemed to be the most effective way to make descent progress. Everything was going well. And then the tubes grew even narrower. As Grady rounded a turn, he noticed that his shoulders no longer had any room at all to waggle. The tube around him didn't feel like a tube anymore. It felt like a second skin. It hugged him like a sausage, casing, compressing ground pork. Grady stopped and tried to push himself back upward, but he couldn't move, not even a little. The tunnel squinched around him, hugging him tighter than his gran had squeezed him when he was a little kid. Oh, how he wished his gran was here now. 
Any grand who could excel at hoops could figure out how to rescue her grandson from a silly plastic tube. And Grady for sure needed rescuing. He was well and truly stuck. The memory of Ballora's help prominent in his mind. Grady didn't call out. He didn't want Ballora's services. Just wait until Grady wrote up his report on the torture device masquerading as, as a service bot. He was going to make sure Ballora's designer never got a job in the industry again. Grady went limp. Now he had no choice. He'd had to stay here until morning. Maybe he'd go to sleep. He was exhausted. Sleep wasn't impossible, even in this miserable position. Grady stiffened. But what if his circulation was being cut off? Grady flexed his hands and his feet. He tightened and released all the muscles in his body. Good. He didn't feel any numbness or tingling. His blood flow was probably okay. All he had to do was control his breathing. Or no, he didn't even have to do that. So what if he panicked and hyperventilated? If he did that, he'd pass out. Passing out wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was almost as good as sleep. Grady forced himself to release the tension in his muscles. He felt tears leak from his eyes. But that was all right. Anyone in this situation would feel like crying. But it was going to be okay. It really is. Grady assured himself. It's, it's going to be fine. Were his words tinged with just a bit of doubt? If so, he was going to ignore it. He'd survived getting locked in the linen closet when he was five, and he'd survived this too. He just had to wait it out. Idly, Grady wondered how many years of therapy he'd need to get over this. For several seconds, Grady breathed in and out, relatively calmly, but then a horrifying thought leaped to the top of his mind. What if Ballora showed up without being called? Grady jerked his head so fast he hit it on the sides of the tunnel. He winced, but he didn't cry out. He had a feeling that he needed to be very, very quiet. Ballora had nearly dismantled his body the first time she'd pulled him through the tunnel. He didn't even want to imagine what she'd do in this situation. Grady returned to his concentrated breathing, but his breath caught when Ballora's voice called out, I don't sense any downward movement. Do you need my help? No, I don't, Grady thought. He knew better than to do... Yeah, he knew better to the... Oh my gosh. <laughs> he knew better than to respond. Any verbal reply from him might trigger Ballora's programming. She would appear and render aid when none was wanted. Several seconds passed. Grady realised his whole body was taut. He concentrated again on relaxing. Do you need my help? Ballora called out again. Grady held his breath. My senses indicate progress has stalled. Ballora reported. Do you want my assistance? No, no, no. Em emphatically, no. Grady thought. Go do a pirouette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that is the best sentence of all the fa uh, the FNAF books. Go do a pirouette. That's such a that's such a good like firing of shots right there. Grady exhaled as quietly as possible. Then he counted his next few breaths. He got up to seven before Ballora called out again. I'm required to provide help to anyone who gets stuck. No one can stay stuck in Ballora's fitness and flex. Fitness is fun. I'll be sure to make... I'll be here... Nah. I'm here to be sure you complete the fitness and flex course. Grady held his breath again. Please, can I help? Ballora called out. Grady stayed silent. I want to help. Ballora persisted. I don't care what you want, Grady thought. I want to keep my arms intact. Grady breathed in and out six more times. The next breath, though, caught in his throat. Ballora's signature thrumming, whirr, was headed this way. When he heard the sound, Grady tried to pull his arms in. Unfortunately, they had no place to go. Grady's arms were outstretched and his shoulders were wedged between the two walls. His arms were dangling below him. They were ripe for the robotic picking. Grady closed his fingers into a fist. Maybe that would make his hands less appealing to the unhelpful robot. Um, Grady remained perfectly still and he held his breath again. He closed his eyes. A metallic clank announced that Ballora had popped up beneath him. When she did her signature spin, he felt the air current waft past his balled up hands. <clears throat> uh, Grady continued to make like an opossum. Maybe if Ballora thought he was dead, she'd go away. Ballora's metal hands gripped Grady's clenched ones. Grady contorted his head to look at Ballora. Go away, he shouted. I don't want your help. Get out of here. Ballora blinked at him, but she didn't let go of his hands. I'm here to help, she insisted. I don't want your help, Grady yelled. He tried to free himself from Ballora's grasp, 
by extending his fingers. She tightened her grip so she couldn't so he couldn't uncurl his fist. Let me go! Grady screamed at her. Go away! But Laura didn't go away. Instead, she started gliding downward, and she yanked Grady down with her. The first knife thrust of pain came quickly. It speared through his shoulder sockets and thrust its way down to his shoulder blades. Grady cried out. It's just a little way to the end, Ballora sang. I'll get you around every bend. Ballora pulled Grady below the crook in the tube that had caught him. It was That was admittedly a bit of a relief, but the relief didn't last long. The tubes became a series of back and forth turns. Something popped in Grady's left shoulder. He screeched. But Laura didn't care. She kept pulling. The joint in Grady's left shoulder was out of its socket. He had felt it dislocate. The searing pain was excruciating. Bad as it was though, those savage sensations didn't hold his attention for long. As Ballora went down around another turn, Grady's wrists cracked. He heard them snapping like breaking pretzels. As soon as they did, he could tell his fists were flopping at the end of his arms. Ballora must have noticed this as well. She, si she shifted her grip to Grady's forearms. As soon as Ballora let go of his clenched fingers, Grady realised the fingers were broken. Actually, they weren't just broken, they were crushed. Ballora had clamped down so hard that she'd pulverised the fragile bones. When Grady tried to move his fingers, he could feel the bone chips grinding together. He howled in pain and terror. How would he be able to do anything ever again with shattered fingers? Grady didn't have long to contemplate this dismal future because his hell was just beginning. As Ballora tugged Grady down around the next twisting turn, his forearms popped free of his elbow joints. Then they too fractured. He heard the crunch as the bones were compressed in Ballora's grip. Grady wasn't conscious of making sounds, but he could hear high-pitched squeaking. The shrieking seemed to be coming from far away, from some place other than himself. But, of course, it wasn't. He was making those shrill sounds, the sounds of someone being mangled alive. A whisper of a thought managed to make its way through Grady's torment. How long had he, could he take this level of pain? Wouldn't he pass out soon? Bullaro came to a stop when Grady got stuck in the tightest corner he'd encountered yet. When she did, she shifted her grip to above his elbows. His upper arms broke. He yowled. Ballora jiggled Grady back and forth. He felt his ribs give way. The sensation was like having a molten hot band of metal kinched around him. And still, he didn't pass out. In the next turn, Grady's hip sockets let go of his leg bones. As they did, Grady realised through the black miasma of his pain that he wasn't going to pass out. He was upside down. Most of his blood was pulled in his head. His brain was well supplied with what it needed to keep trucking along, and his brain didn't care that the rest of him was enduring more pain than the human body was designed to handle. It didn't care that Ballora's determined trek through the tube was deconstructing Grady's skeletal structure joint by joint, bone by bone. It didn't care that Grady was being twisted and compressed into something not like the pretzels he so loved. <laughs> oh, that's such a funny line. That is so, so funny. If you don't understand that, it is obviously a reference to Gregory's line in Security Breach. I don't want to be crushed and twisted into a meat pretzel. Um, I love that line so much. It's so funny that they are able to kind of intertwine the jokes in Security Breach with the jokes in the, the books because they were so closely connected and written together. And um, I, I love that fact that it, it, it makes security reach brighter in my eyes, I think, um, with the fact that the books were written with it and therefore there's going to be Easter eggs, there's going to be really cool things that are connected to the games in the books. Before the next curve in the tube, Ballora repositioned her grip once again. As she did, one of her metal fingers impaled Grady's left eye. Grady keened and heaved. He upchucked his candy bar, the vomit poured into the tube. Ballora slid him down through the mess. The sickly sweet and slightly acidic odour of his vomit hit his nose, and he didn't, and he threw up again. But then he couldn't smell anything anymore. Ballora's rescue efforts on the next series of pleat-like turns pressed his face so hard against the side of the tube that his nose cracked. Grady felt warmth course over his cheek. 
He knew his now eyeless socket was gushing blood, but he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't do anything about anything. All Grady could do was scream and cry as he felt his body break apart. Ooh. I love that. Why don't you have one of those hide a key rocks? Tate asked as Ronan signaled to turn into the employee parking lot at the back of the pizza plex. Ronan didn't think he had to explain anything to Tate. The guy didn't have any right to complain that they had to come back for Ronan's house keys. Ronan gave Tate a ride every day, and Tate never paid for gas. Yet, when Ronan wanted to turn around and go back for his keys, Tate had the nerve to ask Ronan to go to the remaining five miles to Tate's apartment building before returning to the pizzaplex. Ronan had ignored him and made a U-turn. For the last half hour, Tate had been grousing. It's bad enough when we have a 45 minute commute to start with. Now we have to go back and do nearly all of it again? Those fake rocks aren't safe, Ronan told Tate now. Burglars know about them, and they look for them before they bother to break into a home. I read an article about it. Tate rolled his eyes. Whatever. He stared sul sullenly out the passenger window. Ronan pulled his minivan into his assigned parking spot, two down from Grady's. Grady's old pickup was still there. Obviously, he hadn't finished up he hadn't yet finished up his safety checks. Ronan concentrated on positioning the minivan precisely between the lines. When he was satisfied, he put the transmission in park. Tate frowned and looked pointedly at the hundred yards between Ronan's spot and the employee entrance. Why are you parking all the way over here? Ronan turned off the minivan. This is my spot, he explained patiently. Tate threw up his hands. But there's no one around. You could just pull up to the curb. He pointed toward the employee's entrance. Ronan raised an eyebrow. That's a no parking zone. Ronan opened his car door. Come on. Tate gave Ronan a look. Why do I have to go with you? Just leave the keys and I'll hang in here and listen to tunes. Ronan threw Tate's look right back at him. I may look big and dumb, but I'm not. I'm not leaving you with the keys to old Betty. Come on. Ronan gave Tate his best glare. His sister, Rhonda, had told him he looked terrifying when he did that. She thought it was a hoot because he, she knew Ronan didn't like swatting mosquitoes. But Rhonda must have been right about it because people tended to do whatever Ro Ronan wanted when he gave them the glare. Tate, despite being one of the laziest people Ronan had ever met, was no exception. Tate grumbled and got out of the minivan. Ronan carefully locked it up and the two men headed toward the employee entrance. You're one weird dude, Tate told Ronan. If Ronan had gotten the dollar for every time Tate had said that to him, he'd have enough money to buy yarn for the shawl he wanted to knit for his mother. Tate couldn't seem to get over the fact that Ronan was both a bodybuilder and a knitter, that he was in a local fight club and also owned a minivan named Betty so he could drive his knitting club members to textile conventions and knit-alongs. Ronan, however, couldn't care less what Tate thought of him, or what anyone thought of him for that matter. Can we hurry it up? Tate asked, trotting out ahead of Ronan. I told you I'm supposed to meet Karen at the lake. Now I'm going to be late. You're always late. She'll expect it, Ronan said. He didn't pick up his pace. That's low, dude, Tate said. Ronan ignored him. He dug his Pizzaplex keys out of his pants pocket and had them ready when they reached the door. Tate rushed through the door ahead of Ronan as soon as Ronan unlocked the door and deactivated the alarm, and Tate bounced like a kid who needed to pee while Ronan locked the door behind them and reactivated the alarm. Could you be any slower? Tate complained. Ronan pocketed his Pizzaplex keys again and put his hands on his hips. I'm sure I can. Tate exhaled loudly, but he didn't speak again as they strode through the grey double doors leading to the employee break room. Tate meandered into the break room, heading toward the cubby holes where they were supposed to leave the report at the end of the day. Tate was probably going to look at Ronan's and Gra Grady's to compare their progress with his own. Tate was lazy, but he was also comp strangely competitive. Ronan headed into the dingy locker room. With its beige paint job and low wattage light bulbs, it was a surprising contrast to all the screamingly bright colours and lights in the main part of the pizzaplex. Ronan figured Fazbear Entertainment didn't want to spend any more money than necessary on their employees. He couldn't really complain though. His salary was good. This job had given him the down payment to buy his first house. He had no beef with Fazbear Entertainment. They could paint their locker rooms any boring colour they wanted. Ronan opened his locker and rummaged behind his toolkit. He kept his house keys in his backpack, which he'd grabbed when he and Tate had left. 
His keys, however, must have slipped out when he'd gotten his lunch from his pack earlier in the day. Yep, there they were. They'd fallen behind his spare uniform shirt. Ronan grabbed the keys and closed his locker. He turned. Hey, Ronan, Tate called. Come here a second. <clears throat> uh, Ronan strode into the employee break room. He found Tate rifling through, or riffling, th sorry, riffling through Grady's paperwork. Paperwork, just as Ronan had suspected. Why are you looking at Grady's stuff? Ronan asked, as if he didn't know. Tate didn't answer the question. He waved a sheaf of paper. Did you know he was going to do Ballora's next? I thought he was going to do that next week, but he scheduled it for today. Ronan gave Tate a, what's your point, look. Tate grinned. He's probably down there right now. Can you imagine him squeezing through those tubes? He whooped in laughter. Tate stuffed Grady's papers back in their slot. Come on, let's go check on him. Ronan raised both eyebrows. I thought you were in a hurry. You said you were going to be late. Tate waved away the idea. I'm already late. What's the matter if I'm a little late? A, a little later. Karen can wait. Karen has a terrible taste in men, Ronan thought. He'd met Karen. She was cute and seemed sweet. What did she see in Tate? All right, Ronan said. He had no trouble with checking on Grady. He'd been reluctant to leave Grady alone in the first place. He didn't like breaking the rules, but Grady had insisted and Ronan had wanted to get home. He'd planned on making some hummus dip and homemade whole wheat pita bread, bread for the knitting club meeting. Now he wouldn't have time for the bread, but he could still do the dip, even if he and Tate took a few minutes to go down to Ballora's. Even if I didn't have bad knees, Tate was saying as they walked to the main concourse, I still wouldn't have done Ballora's. Those tunnels are too small, and I don't even have claustrophobia or anything, not like Grady. Grady doesn't have claustrophobia, Ronan said. He has cleithrophobia. Tate ignored him. Whatever. It's the fear of being trapped, Ronan explained. People with claustrophobia don't like small spaces, whether they're trapped or not. People with cleithrophobia can tolerate small spaces as long as they know they can come and go. They're afraid of being stuck. Tate raised an eyebrow. How do you know all that? Ronan shrugged. I read. Ronan lengthened his stride, and Tate trotted to keep up. But why do you know that's what Grady has? Tate asked. Ronan flicked a glance at Tate. I listen. Tate didn't answer. He probably hadn't even gone the dig. He was looking at the darkened entrance to the roleplay area. He waved a hand toward it. In the morning, I'll be checking the sets in there. Can't wait to see what they've done with the Fazbear's Fright haunted house. I love how they mention specifically the Fazbear's Fright. I was so spoked, stoked when I saw it on the specs. Not for the first time, Ronan wondered how Tate managed to do his job. Not that he did that well. Ronan and Grady both had covered for Tate too many times to count. Tate's work was half-hazard half -hazard, sorry, and incomplete. The man's mind was like a squirrel. It was constantly darting from here to there and back again, and eventually it led back around to their previous conversation. Who would want that? Who would want to be trapped? Ronan didn't bother to answer what he figured was a rhetorical question. He kept his gaze straight ahead, making sure he didn't look at the swings. In the faint security lights, the swings looked too much like a giant squid to suit Ronan. Ronan didn't like squids. They were gushy. Ronan didn't like gushy. Ronan's mother often teased him about how he had a soft stomach when it came to things like squids or slugs or worms and anything he had to do with the inside of a human body. Rock hard abs on the outside and soft and gooey on the inside, she always teased him. Tate jogged out ahead of Ronan in a long red hallway that led to Ballora's. When they reached the stairs, he perched his bony butt on the ra railing and slid down it, hopping onto the floor at the bottom before Ronan got halfway down the long flight. Tate did a funky little dance to music only he could hear. He looked up the stairs. Come on, slowpoke. Ronan shot Tate his patented glare, but Tate was too busy spinning on one foot to notice. Ronan trotted down the last few steps, and Tate stopped dancing. Together, they headed into a curved yellow hallway of Ballora's Fitness and Flex. When they were just halfway around the curve, they knew Grady was indeed in the fitness venue. Ballora's entrance was fully lit. Its archway was illuminated like the sparkling marquee of a Broadway show. Beyond the entrance, all the lights in the venue were on too. Tate trotted through the archway. Yo, Grady, he called out. Dude, hope you're not stuck. Ronan shook his head. He sighed and followed his uncouth co-worker into Ballora's. He didn't notice that Tate had stopped until he literally ploughed into him. 
Sorry, Ronan said automatically as Tate stutter stepped forward and windmilled his arms to keep his balance. Tate didn't say anything, which was weird. Tate always had something to say. Ronan looked at Tate and he quickly lifted his head to follow the direction of Tate's wide-eyed stare. The second Ronan looked upward, he wished he hadn't. He saw what had grabbed Tate's attention immediately. It was impossible to miss. Ronan leaned over and covered his mouth. He felt faint, so he went to his knees. His breath was coming fast. The room started to spin. Tate crouched down next to him. Tuck your head, big guy. Breathe slow. Tate draped an arm over Ronan's shoulder. Just a mi Just take a minute. Because Ronan didn't want to think about what he'd seen, he focused on Tate's out-of-character compassion. He'd never known Tate to be so nice. Why wasn't he acting like his usual jerky self? Tate patted Ronan's back. That's it. Keep breathing slowly. Look at me. Ronan tried to do as instructed as he turned toward his co-worker. Tate, however, wasn't looking at Ronan. He was staring at the tubes behind the tran transparent wall. Ronan thought about what he'd just seen inside one of those tubes. His stomach heaved. He clapped a hand over his mouth. Poor Grady. It was Grady. Wasn't it? Ronan couldn't bring himself to look again. It is Grady. Oh, sorry. Is it Grady? Ronan asked Tate. Who else would it be? Tate snapped. Ah, there was the Tate whom Ronan knew so well. But he's... Ronan stopped. He didn't want to speak out loud that about the mangled, twisted, broken limbs and torso that used to be Grady. Seeing it had been bad enough. Talking about it would somehow make it worse. Ronan wondered if he'd ever erased from his mind the image of Grady's wrecked body suspended upside down in the tube, tucked back and forth, unthinkably, in a tight series of the tube's zigzags. How would Ronan ever forget Grady's misshapen face with its one remaining good eye plastered against the plastic? Ugh. <laughs> he was sure he'd never be able to wipe from his memory Banks, uh, Grady's empty socket, or the eyeball dangling from one of Ballora's metal fingers. And he would be forever tormented by the image of Grady's 5 foot 6 inch frame elongated into nearly twice that length. Grady's body now so deconstructed that it was strewn through the tube. What happened? Ronan asked. It was a stupid question, of course. It was clear, even in the few seconds he'd looked at Grady's dif disfigured body, what had happened. Clearly, Ballora's designer hadn't included a failsafe. Some command that told her getting unstuck was less important than making sure the person she was helping wasn't injured. The robot was outrageously flawed. This is bad, Tate said. Ronan wanted to say something sarcastic, but it wasn't appropriate. He swallowed and licked his lips. I didn't look long enough, he said, and I can't. I can't look again. Is he alive? Tate took a few steps toward the transparent wall. Ronan watched Tate, but didn't look beyond him into the tube again. Tate squinted at the tube. I don't know. It's hard to see whether he's breathing. Ronan's stomach flipped over. He dropped his head. His eyes moistened. He and Grady hadn't been close or anything. They were just co-workers. But Grady had been a nice guy. And nice guy or not, no one deserved to die like that. Tate inhaled sharply. Ronan's head snapped up. What? Tate took another step toward the tubes. Oh man, he said. I think I just saw him blink. Ronan groaned. He couldn't even imagine, didn't want to imagine, what Grady was feeling. In the too long glimpse he'd gotten of Grady, Ronan had seen that not only were Grady's limbs contorted into impossible positions, but his uniform was saturated with blood. Many of his bone breaks must have been compound fractures. Ronan could only guess, not that he wanted to, at how many times Grady's shattered bones had jabbed through his skin. Yeah, Tate said. He just did it again. He's alive. Tate sounded calm, but his voice was tight. Ronan found it absurdly comforting that Tate was affected by what he was looking at. Maybe the guy wasn't as shallow as Ronan had thought. Although Tate was looking directly at the blood, uh, the bloody crime, crimped up Grady as if gaw gawking at an exhibit in a zoo. Ronan forced himself to stand. He had to concentrate to make sure his legs held him up. We need to get him out of there, Ronan said. Tate slowly turned and goggled at Ronan. And just how are we going to do that? We have no way to get into those tubes. We need to call 911. Ronan reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Before he could lift it though, Tate plucked it from his hand. Dude, Tate said, clutching his phone. What are you thinking? I'm thinking we need to get him out of there and if we can't do it, we need someone else 
to get here who can? Tate shook his head. We can do that. Ronan raised both eyebrows. What in the world do you mean? Tate didn't answer. He looked back at Grady. Give me my phone. Ronan tried to grab it. Tate hopped out of reach. I can't do that, dude. Ronan tried his glare. Tate shook his head. You don't get it. If we call someone, it's going to come out that we left him here alone. Totally against the rules. That's what I said earlier. Yeah, I know. But no matter what you said, we left him. And this happened. He waved toward the tubes. Ronan didn't look in the direction of the gesture. Obviously, this venue is totally screwed up if this happened. Tate went on. If Grady survives, he would have no problem making a worker's comp claim. Heck, he, or most likely his family, because I don't see how he can survive that. Tate waved his hand at the tubes. Might even be able to sue Fazbear Entertainment. If an injury is intentional, an employee or surviving family can sue. And intentional is defined as having certain knowledge an injury would occur and willfully disregarding that knowledge. Ronan stared at Tate open-mouthed. How do you know all that? Tate shrugged. My old man's a lawyer. No kidding. Ronan shook his head, but Fazbear Entertainment couldn't have known for sure someone would get injured in there. He waved in the direction of the tubes. Tate snorted. Are you kidding me? He too gestured at the tubes. Do you see the size of these lower tubes? No way a full-sized man can make it through those. And yet, they wanted one of us to test it. They had to have known we'd get hurt. It wouldn't be hard to make a case. Ronan rubbed his forehead. Okay, fine. But that means they deserve to be sued. Why can't we get him out? Tate turned his back to the tubes and stood right in front of Ronan. When he spoke again, his voice was even. And he spoke, and he spoke slowly as if explaining algebra to a ten-year-old. Grady's injuries are a liability nightmare. What do you think Fazbear Entertainment is going to do with the two employees who left Grady here by himself to get stuck? Ronan thought. Even if they'd stayed, they wouldn't have been with Grady. He still could have gotten stuck. He opened his mouth to say that, but Tate spoke first. And even if we argued that it would have happened anyway, we broke protocol and the result was disastrous. They'd have clear grounds to fire us. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get fired. Ronan thought about what would happen with his new mortgage payment if he lost his job. No, he didn't want to get fired either. But was his new house more important than another human's life? Obviously not. Even so, Ronan said, we have to help him. He's... His voice broke. He couldn't even find the words to describe it. Yeah, I know, Tate said. I know. He too cleared his throat. But look at him. The minute anyone tries to move him, he's going to be in excruciating pain and he'll bleed out before they can get him to the hospital. There's no way he can survive. Ronan had a terrible thought. But, but if he's blinking, that means he's conscious and... He couldn't say it. And yeah, he's probably in horrible pain. I get it. But then again, maybe not. Look at how his spine is all screwed up. Maybe he's paralyzed. There's no way he could tell. There's no way to tell. Uh, Tate said. That blinking could just be a reflex or something. Ronan didn't look at Grady's spine. He latched onto the hope that Grady couldn't feel any of the agony racking through his body. You think so? Ronan asked. Tate nodded vehemently. <laughs> Vehement. Vehemently. I really do. Ronan chewed on his lower lip. As if sensing Roman's indecision. Uh, Ronan's indecision, sorry, not Roman's. <laughs> Tate moved in and put a hand on Ronan's forearm. This sucks, the big one. It really does. But Grady might as well be dead. And anything we do to help him right now is going to get us in really big trouble. There's no upside to us calling anyone. Not for Grady, and not for us. He's gone, whether dead or soon to be. Maybe he wasn't even blinking. Maybe it was just a death spasm. And I bet he'd be the first one to say there's no point in us throwing away good jobs and maybe even our careers by letting anyone know we let him stay here. Ronan kept chewing on his lip. Tate was making sense. But this was Tate, one of the most self-interested people Ronan had ever met. Or had ever meant. I think, I think that's a typo. Uh, who cared if Tate made sense? Then again, what would be the point in losing their jobs if Grady was already dead? Or if he couldn't even survive the extraction? Ronan thought about his nice house and his lovely friends in the knitting club. He thought about all the luscious yarn he'd recently bought because his pay was so good. Did he want to give all that up? Tate gripped Ronan's arm. Listen, 
All we have to do is walk away. We leave. The CCTV isn't installed yet, so they're not tracking us. We'll just say that we all left at quitting time like usual. Grady must have come back on his own. We didn't know about it. Mona lifted his head and forced himself to look at Grady again. If he was going to abandon a dying man, the least he could do was acknowledge the man before he left. Ronan had to cover his mouth again but, um, when his gaze landed on Grady's misshapen and bloody form. He clutched his stomach, sure he was going to heave. Keep it together, big guy, Tate said softly. Ronan brushed away tears and looked into Grady's one remaining eye. The eye looked back at Ronan, unblinking. Ronan noticed that Grady's brown iris was cloudy. Was he dead already? No. The eye twitched. He was still alive. What was Grady thinking as he stared out at his co-workers? Was he thinking? Would a man in that condition still have rational thought? If Grady was thinking, Ronan couldn't tell. Grady's face was so smashed that no expression was possible. Was Grady hoping they'd save him, or was he wishing that they'd, let him, that they'd go and let him die? Ronan dropped his gaze. Bye, Grady, he whispered. Tate took Ronan's arm and turned him away from the tubes. Gently, Tate led Ronan out of Ballora's. Ronan half closed his eyes against the blinding lights of Ballora's archway as Tate ushered him into the yellow hallway. He didn't let himself think about what they were walking away from. Instead, he concentrated on making his legs work. He focused on breathing in and out. All we have to do, Tate said, as they followed uh, the curved hallway heading toward the stairs, is coming to work as usual in the morning. He'll be dead by then. Grady's remaining eye watched his co-workers. They disappeared around the corner of the yellow hallway. He hadn't been able to hear everything Ronan and Tate had said, even though his ears still worked. They were the only body parts that had avoided massive trauma the tube and the transparent, war-muted sound. He had, however, heard enough. Grady had wanted to cry, even more than he already had when Tate had hit, ha, ha, hypothesized that Grady was paralyzed, if only. Yes, Grady's spine was broken, but somehow his nerve endings were functioning just fine. The totality of his body was one throbbing mass of indescribable suffering. Grady couldn't hate his co-workers for leaving him to die. He'd probably have done the same thing if he'd been in their place. He needed this job just as badly. But he wished they'd stayed with him a little while longer. Ballora, who had been silently pulling on Grady the whole time Ronan and Tate had been standing there talking, spoke up. You're stuck. I'll help you. She yanked harder, and Grady heard a series of wet pops and two cracks. New waves of pain sloiced through Grady's arms and cascaded through his whole body. Grady couldn't even protest the assault on his system. Even if he could have, he wouldn't have. He was dying, and the only company he had was Ballora. He couldn't have sent her away now, for anything. If Grady had to die trapped in his worst nightmare, he didn't want to do it alone. Even Ballora's cold and unfeeling grip was better than nothing. Ballora spoke up one more time. You're stuck. I want to help. Wow. That is, that is the end of that story. That is... <laughs> that was uh, a story and a half. <laughs> it was quite uh, horrific, quite gory, and I like the gory stories, of course. Uh, and I think they did a really good job of writing it. Honestly, I think it was a really good story. Uh, and I, I just, I'm just baffled by the prologue. Honestly, the prologue is amazing with the um, the tour of the Pizzaplex and seeing what happened to Maya. But uh, really, just like out of the scope of the, the prologue, the entire story, it, it just, it, it has a really nice vibe to it. And by nice, I don't mean lovely, like flowers and butterflies. I mean, like, just really good writing and really amazing moments there. And uh, although I don't think it's, it's very lore relevant, in fact, I don't think it is lore relevant in any way, <laughs> shape or form, uh, I, I think it's, it's just generally... A really, really good story. So, that is that. And that is almost the end of Somnophobia. We, of course, have the epilogue for Somnophobia still coming. So, that is going to probably be tomorrow. But, I don't know. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.